You thought this series was over. Well, here I am with a bonus episode on Antarctica, a fascinating continent with a very unique geopolitical situation. Hey Slavic Vikings and welcome to Geopolitics of Antarctica. The vast white expanse at the bottom of our planet that remains an enigma in many ways unlike any other continent. The territorial claims have been a peculiar twist. Several nations have stacked their claims, drawn their lines on the maps, but due to international agreements, these borders are more theoretical than practical. The Antarctic Treaty System ratified in 1961 ensures that the continent is preserved for peaceful and scientific purposes. This treaty in essence freezes all territorial ambitions, except for Russia and the US. They can make any claims they like whenever they choose so. Realistically Russia will never do this, but I believe the US is just patiently waiting for the ice to melt and to reveal valuable resources before it will legally claim this continent. The treaty also made militarization and nuclear testing a strict no-go, this being the main reason for the creation of the treaty since it was made during the Cold War. While the countries that already made claims can keep them, the treaty ensures that they can't enforce these claims in any traditional sense. Interestingly, under this treaty one country can comfortably set up research stations within the claimed territory of another, blurring the lines of sovereignty in the name of cooperation and scientific advancement. Antarctica was the last place on earth to be discovered, remaining largely a mystery until the 19th and early 20th century. This remoteness is what allowed it to become a place where the usual rules of geopolitics are turned on their head, creating a unique blend of collaboration and very subtle competition. Norway has a fascinating connection to Antarctica. Despite being the first nation to reach the South Pole thanks to the legendary expedition led by Roald Amundsen in 1911, two decades later laid claim to this area naming it Queen Maud Land. However notable being the only country to leave out the South Pole area to its claim. However this changed in 2015 with them claiming that their territory fully stretched to the South Pole. Despite this I think it is a beautiful thing that the only country to actually reach the South Pole first was the only one to refrain from claiming it. Within Queen Maud Land, Troll Station is one of the most prominent, serving as a year-round research facility and the only all-year research station operated by the Norwegians in Antarctica. Then there's Tor Station, which plays a pivotal role during the summer months. The significance of these bases extends beyond mere scientific research. They're beacons of Norway's presence underlining its stake and interest in the geopolitics of the region. Moreover, these bases, especially Troll, have become vital stops for logistics, with many international Antarctic missions making use of the facility. This has further solidified Norway's role in fostering international cooperation, even as countries navigate the blurred lines of territorial claims and shared interests. Examples like this is what makes me believe that this concept of sharing Antarctica is one of the more wholesome parts of humanity. Just one year before the Nazis invaded Norway, they invaded Norway's Antarctica by flying over some of their territory and dropping darts with swastika flags, and claimed this shown territory naming it Neuschwanwabensland. As you could have guessed, many theorize that this is where Hitler evacuated after losing World War II. Anyways, back to real geopolitics. After countries started claiming Antarctica, Chile and Argentina reminded themselves that they claimed parts of the island before it was even discovered. Long story short, during the colonization of America, under the Treaty of Tordesillas in 1494, the Pope divided the world along this line. 
Everything on the right was Spanish and the left was Portuguese. However, with this, the Pope not being clear on where the line ends, these independent South American nations assumed it went all the way down to the South Pole. So that is what justified these two claims. However, Chile is the only country that holds a geographical claim. Chile claims that the Scotia Ridge that eventually extends and touches Antarctica is an extension of the Andes mountain range. And since the Andes are a crucial part of Chilean geography, Chile gets to claim this part of Antarctica. I forgot to mention that Chile's claim territory is known ingeniously as Chilean Antarctic territory, and it overlaps with both British and Argentine claims. But this overlap has no actual consequences, in part because of the Treaty of Antarctica, but also since before the treaty, these countries just ignored each other and somehow coexisted peacefully. The Eduardo Fry base, named after the former Chilean president, is one of the largest South American bases in Antarctica. It includes a village, a school, and even a post office. Even more creative, the Argentinian claim is called Argentine Antarctica. This claimed territory is fully inside the British claim. However, Argentina was one of the first nations to have an active presence in Antarctica, establishing the Orcadas base in 1904, which is recognized as the oldest base on the continent still in operation. Beyond just territorial claims, Argentina has been at the forefront of scientific endeavors in Antarctica. The Belgrano second base, located south of the Antarctic Circle, is the sovereign most permanently inhabited establishment on the continent. Argentina's relation to Antarctica isn't just about land and research. It's intrinsically tied to the country's identity. Children in Argentina are taught in schools about the nation's Antarctic province, and they often see the map of the country that includes this claimed slice of Antarctica. Yet for all its assertiveness, Argentina's claim on the continent is not without complications. As mentioned earlier, there's an overlap with both Chilean and British territorial assertions. This triangular overlap has sometimes been a point of contention, but they usually have more important conflicts to solve, like for example the Falkland Islands. It seems like the Nazis are the only creative ones when it comes to naming since Australia's territory is known as the Australian Antarctic Territory. This claim is by far the biggest, stretching over nearly 5.9 million square kilometers, it encompasses about 42% of the total Antarctic continent. This makes it the largest territorial claim in Antarctica. The genesis of Australia's claim can be tracked back to the United Kingdom. The British laid claim to this part of Antarctica in the early 20th century. However, in 1933, as a symbol of Australia's increasing autonomy from its former colonial master, the UK transferred its claim to Australia, laying the groundwork for what would become the AAT. It's the same story with New Zealand's territory, by the way. An example of an Australian vital facility is Casey Station strategically situated and known for its work in atmospheric sciences. It's particularly renowned for its research into the impact of climate change on the Antarctic ecosystem. New Zealand's territory is creatively named Ross Dependency. It lies directly south of New Zealand. Scott Base is the heart of New Zealand's Antarctic activities. Established in 1957, the base is painted in a unique shade of aqua making it distinguishable on the white canvas of ice. It serves as a hub for scientific studies, particularly in areas like climate research, biology and geology. This is another base that has been the starting point for countless expeditions and has been vital for studying the unique Antarctic ecosystem. The tale of France's involvement in Antarctica is deeply rooted in the thin line known as Adélie land, located directly south of Madagascar, a past French colony. The land itself is named Adélie after the 
discoverer's wife, Adele, which is the most French thing ever. Excuse my pronunciation, by the way. Uh, speaking of the Mont d'Urville station, named after the aforementioned explorer, was established in the early 1950s. The station has witnessed countless French scientific achievements. One cannot discuss the UK in Antarctica without referring to the fateful expedition led by Captain Robert Falcon Scott. His legendary yet tragic journey to the South Pole in 1912 is an embodiment of British perseverance in the face of adversity. Scott and his team, despite their valiant efforts, were beaten to the pole by the Norwegian team led by Roald Amundsen. Moreover, they all died on the way back. Historically, prior to the decolonization, the UK held an absolutely huge claim over Antarctica. This vast stretch of ice was symbolic of a time when the sun never set on the British Empire. However, today the British Antarctic Survey stands testament to the UK's continuous presence and commitment to the region, with several research stations including the well-known Haley and Rothera research stations. The BAS spearheads numerous scientific endeavors ranging from climate studies to biodiversity research. Intriguingly, remnants of the old empire can still be glimpsed in the region. Abandoned whaling stations and huts from earlier expeditions tell tales of a time when Britain aimed to imprint its legacy on every corner of the globe. We have now officially covered every official claim in Antarctica. But there is one last place left. Murray Birdland, a place so remote and challenging to access that no single nation has ever staked a formal claim on it. Spanning over 1,600,000 square kilometers, this vast portion of West Antarctica is in essence a geopolitical wildcard. At first glance, one might think its lack of formal claims might be due to its perceived lack of value. But in a world where every piece of land, no matter how barren or remote, has potential strategic significance, there's more to this narrative. The primary reason for the absence of claims is the region's sheer inaccessibility. Nestled deep in the heart of Antarctica, it is surrounded by massive ice shelves and treacherous seas, making it almost impossible for any expedition to this land. This remoteness has in many ways acted as a natural barrier, deterring nations from pursuing formal territorial ambitions. And even if you would want to, you can't since the Treaty of Antarctica prohibits new claims. But let's not forget that this part of the treaty doesn't involve Russia or the US. So technically, the US or Russia could claim this land whenever they want to. The fact that despite this, none of them are bothering to do so, is a true showcase of how remote Maori bird land is. 2048 might seem like a distant year, but for the world of geopolitics and particularly for Antarctica, it's a date circled in red. It's the year that the Protocol on Environmental Protection to the Antarctic Treaty is up for review. This looming date opens up a myriad of possibilities and uncertainties for the continent. This treaty, signed by 54 countries, ensures that Antarctica is left out of the destructive nature of human settlement. The 2048 review, however, could change this. With the expiration of the treaty's mineral protocol, the vast untouched resources of Antarctica could suddenly become available for exploitation. We're talking about oil, gas, minerals and fisheries. As global reserves dwindle and demand for these resources continue to rise, the temptation for countries to delve into Antarctica's resources could become too strong to resist. And I am looking at you, America. Given the potential environmental consequences of a large-scale extraction, countries could come together to reinforce the treaty, emphasizing scientific research and environmental protection over resource extraction. This would be the most peaceful scenario, maintaining the status quo of international cooperation. 
but this is boring so let's explore other possibilities. Without a renewed commitment, countries might rush to assert these claims and start exploiting resources. This could lead to disputes both legal and potentially even military, as nations scramble to secure their share. And as such, countries with existing strong claims, such as Antarctica, Chile or Argentina, might merge as regional powerhouses. Dominating specific zones and wielding considerable influence over resource distribution. Beyond the original claimants, new global powers might see the potential in Antarctica and establish a presence leading to a more complex geopolitical matrix. Other than the mentioned USA, I see China potentially investing in this region, if its demographic crisis hasn't caused the CCP to collapse at that point. The expiration of the treaty presents both a challenge and opportunity. The challenge is in ensuring that the geopolitical ambitions of nations don't lead to the desecration of the last untouched wilderness on earth. The opportunity lies in forging a new path of cooperation, where the collective interest in preserving Antarctica's environment outweighs individual nationalistic pursuits. Whatever the outcome in 2048 is, one thing is clear. The decisions made regarding Antarctica will have profound implications not just for the continent itself, but for global geopolitics, environmental stewardship, and the legacy we leave for future generations. And you can be sure that I'll be covering this revision of the treaty, so make sure to subscribe so you don't miss it in 2048. And with this video complete, we can finally confidently say that we covered every single continent and country in the world. I'm not going to lie, this series has been a challenge and I somewhat regret doing it. The idea started by me wanting to make a video on the geopolitics of Europe and then thinking why not cover every single continent, one by one. I was internally motivated for the first three continents with them being the most interesting. However, somewhere in the middle of this series, I really lost motivation. I wanted to use my time and energy onto more interesting projects where I can explore some interesting ideas. Instead of repeating for the hundredth time that this country supports China over Taiwan. Also, many of the countries I covered never deserved any coverage since they were boring or had nothing interesting to say about them. I believe my slow loss of motivation towards this series and me wanting to get over it is very visible with the slow decline of the quality of these videos. My first videos on Europe and Africa and even Asia are much better than the last continents, in part due to me losing motivation towards this series but also in the nature of some continents just being more boring. I'm looking at you Oceania. Nevertheless, I got it over with, I covered the geopolitics of every single country in the world and I'm sure I made a ton of mistakes. And if enough of you find these mistakes and correct me in the comments, I'll make sure to make a video correcting every single mistake I made. I'm very excited to explore many fascinating concepts in my future videos, so make sure to subscribe if you want to see them. And as always, Favel, Jegnam, and goodbye.